Okay, just one second. Are you hot, James? Actually, I am. It's okay. okay. It's toasty in here. We're ready. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And the thermostat's in the owner's office and it's locked. Oh. Yeah. You ready? Thank you. Go right ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to visit with you tonight and for uh, your leadership for our great state. Uh, having represented a portion of Montgomery County when I was in the state Senate, I always was very right. um, energized by the level of involvement, the high information voters. Uh, you didn't have a name as Tea Party back then, but the spirit was very much alive. And that always appealed to me because I recognize that our state's growing. We have challenges. Uh, we have to solve those challenges. And we have to do it in a way that um, preserves our free market enterprise system, in my personal opinion, and do it in a way that encourages individual responsibility. And so uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have served uh, this community uh, in the state Senate for uh, several years. And while I was there, was ranked among the top conservatives in the state Senate because I always would look for common sense solutions without ever compromising who I was or what I stood for. So uh, thank you all for formalizing that now and fighting for our, our great nation. Uh, I think uh, what you recognize is the same thing that I recognize, and that is politicians of both parties have failed us. Yeah. Uh, we have a, uh, for too long, those that have said one thing while campaigning and then govern another way. And that's led to some uh, critical failures. And that's why in this race for Lieutenant Governor, I've established a contract with Texans and have put what I stand for and what I believe in in black and white. I have signed my name on the bottom line because I expect to be held accountable. That is the only way we can salvage our state and to take on the rapid growth that we have is to have a high level of transparency have officials that not only talk about it, but then go and do it. And I think that can be used as a scorecard, and that's what I'm hopeful for. And there are specifics in that contract with Texas that I think we need to be focused on as a state. And it starts with border security, quite frankly, because Washington has failed to act. This is an issue that I didn't just get involved in because it's campaign season. Uh, I had landowners that actually reached out to me who were being chased off their property by violent and treacherous drug cartel members and mm. uh, uh, the federal government just quite frankly made fun of them. Mm. And it's a tragic situation and I developed a six point plan to reform our failed immigration system that does not include amnesty and starts with border security. And when I mean it doesn't include amnesty, it is an utter failed approach to think that we should offer a pathway to citizenship as a yeah. consolation prize for those that have violated our nation's entry laws. Mm -hmm. We cannot do that. We must not do that. The second thing that we need to be looking at as a state and that I'm going to be focused on as Lieutenant Governor are jobs in our economy. And the way that we that approach should be is to recognize that the private sector is the area that needs to be solving problems, not a new government program. The way that you have tracked the private sector is to have low taxes, to have fair regulations, and to have honest courts. That is a recipe that works and that can uh, help grow jobs in our economy. Now, a very third and important area of state government that we need to be always focused on is education. And, and I must say that our society is doomed if we have an education system where we abdicate our responsibility to government bureaucrats to educate our kids. Mm. The only way to have an efficient system is to have one where parents are driving that system where taxpayers are engaged and information is fully available. We have to end a culture of teaching to the test. We have to recognize that there is no one size fits all. What works in Houston doesn't work in uh, uh, Harrison County in East Texas. Uh, we also need to recognize that the dollars that we're spending, they need to be dedicated to the classroom and they need to be tied to results. And we need to have that strong, accountable and efficient system while we have a quality system and recognizing that one size doesn't fit all. And then the fourth area that I think is so important that we, we never lose sight of, um, and that is this. The federal government did not create the states. The states created the federal government. And if you had a person going around on the street today and asking kids, I don't know that they'd know yeah, the see, that, that. That doesn't sound right to me. I can't be. Yeah, they would think that, that, that the federal government created the states. It's not the United States of America. It's the United States of America. That's right. And <laughs> our states have to reassert our role. Yes. Uh, and that's why I have uh, 
told people no several times when they tried to get me to go to Washington because our states need to function and then Washington will have to do the right thing if we become the leaders that we're supposed to be once mm -hmm. again. Uh, uh, resisting Obamacare, resisting um, the, the downward in expansion of failed systems like Medicaid. And I'm, oh, I didn't even get a one minute warning. So. <laughs> you could normally finish your thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I looked at 146 and then uh, I got talked about states' rights and, and lost track of the time. But these are the four areas. I know it's competitive race. I know that there's four people. I know that we're four elected officials that I have records and I hope you ask me fully and thoughtfully of anything that you've heard, said, or read about because I want to talk about it. I'm doing this because I believe in it and because I want to fight for a strong Texas. So thank you very much. What we're going to do is run out. Okay. Actually, we, won't we go to the calendar? No, you don't. No, you don't. I'm now. So okay. I'm, I'm ending getting well, here. The ladies first. Ladies there you go. go. So I might want to move back. Those are the two siblings in here. <coughs> These two guys are yeah. very sick. So I was telling him he sick might want to move back a little. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I won't I won't try not to cough on you. I'm on the way out. Um, I'm good. Common Core. Mm -hmm. Even though we have, even though Barry had said it would stay out of Texas, it's in our schools. C scope is still in our schools. I see this as huge problems in the education system. I don't think that we don't that we don't have enough money in education. I think we almost have too much money. Yeah, that's true. Because we have too much administration. Mm -hmm. What would you do to help to get real teachers back in teaching kids solid curriculum? and not teaching down to kids. Well, well, the first thing we have to avoid is for 181 politicians in Austin to be the ones writing the lesson plans. <laughs> uh, chapter 26 of the Education Code uh, is the code that requires things like C-scope not to happen. But we know that it did because they yeah. failed to follow the law. Uh, I mean, unpatriotic lesson plans, environmental extremism have no place in our classrooms. As a taxpayer, it offends me greatly. As a parent, it offends me that that is going on. But while we found that out in one instance, we don't know what's going on in Austin ISD. We don't know what's going on in Dallas ISD. And we need a structure and a system. And what I want to do is to have opportunities for those lesson plans before the school year begins to have parents and teachers to be talking about those lesson plans and have samples of those and so that parents can see that and taxpayers can see what's being taught and it's not being hit from them. There's no place in our society for anything that's being taught to the children in our schools that parents and taxpayers not to have full access to. So I think that is a part of the structure that we need to do and what I want to see as Lieutenant Governor. Um, we know that our we have five million school kids where it grows by 80,000 students each year. Mm -hmm. We need to recognize that uh, Article 7 of our state constitution requires state government to provide for an efficient system of free public schools. We also need to recognize that that's in our state constitution. I've read our U.S. Constitution. I've never seen it there. Nope. They need to get out of the business completely. They need to not have a Department of Education. They need to quit taking our tax dollars. And states need to be... Uh, uh, the ones providing that funding, not the federal government, but we have to do it in a way to where local schools are the ones in charge of that and not, not being driven from Austin. And that's gonna be a key area, I think, as we move forward in, in recognizing that there has to be accountability at every step, but you don't have to sacrifice quality to have accountability. That needs to be so important as we're focused on what type of education system we have. We have... Okay, yeah. yeah. Let's we'll do a better job watching this clock. Okay, good. And, and again, you can finish your sentence. Yeah, we're yeah. not hard fast well, on that. Well, we're I, easy going guys. Yeah, well, I, I want it to be conversational, so y'all can cut into my five minute close if you need to. <laughs> okay. Well, so. okay. well, I want to ask a question or two about property taxes. Uh, many of us could probably write 10 or 20 pages right off the bat about what's wrong with Texas property taxes. And even though most of it is, is uh, local taxes, they do it with the authority of the legislature, and the legislature can pull the strings if they want to. So I'm, I'm sick and tired of asking people what they think about it because they all say the right thing. We need the consumption, we need this, and we need that. Right. <clears throat> so as Lieutenant Governor, how are you going to change the situation that we've been stuck with for my entire life? 
Well, I, I will fiercely oppose trading it for a personal income tax. I'll fight against that with everything. But you know, have. not not to divert you too much, but at this stage in my life, mm -hmm. I make no money. Well, I make a little bit of money, but personal income tax I don't think would be nearly as bad as the, the huge property tax. Most people pay half of their entire Social Security check mm -hmm. as property tax. And our property tax is a lot higher than most people's uh, income tax. But I'm glad you're not going to pose an income tax. Well, they're being and, taxed out of their homes. Well, they are being and taxed out of their homes. Yeah. The, the problem with the personal income tax is that it would usher in huge sources of revenues when you have swings in the economy. You'd get that addiction to spending. And at least in this mechanism, you have rollback rates. And I think one of the areas we need to look at is potentially lowering that rollback rate so that uh, you can have more restraints on, uh, uh, on spending. The problem is you as an individual homeowner may be seeing a huge spike, but overall your property tax, your, you know, the local unit of government is not raising it too much. And that's what we've got to find a way to give that relief to the property tax payer. Um, I've helped pass tax cuts in both chambers of the legislature by dedicating excess general revenue to lower our property tax rates. But we never see that. The bill comes back, it's always a little bit higher. Or, or, or up to the maximum. Because, that's right, that's right, because your, your value. But in terms of dollars, the dollars yeah. never go down. Yeah. <clears throat> because your values just continue to right. rise is what they right. do. And that's, that's where you get it. They gerrymand it. Well, the appraisals do, not necessarily the value. <laughs> yeah. And, and having uh, been in the real estate appraisal business, real estate mm -hmm. brokers business, a property tax consultant, I know that the appraisal districts are the ones that train the appraisal review boards. Right. And we need to remove that opportunity to uh, in the, finding out the way, the most efficient way to do it to where you, uh, and probably the controller's office is the way that that needs to come from, mm -hmm. rather than those that are selected at the local level um, on the appraisal review board so that right. you have that independence. <coughs> but don't you think a system like we have that discriminates against old people and disabled people, rewards people that ought to be punished, punishes the group that ought to be rewarded, needs to basically be revamped and replaced with something else? It, and it does need to do that, and our sales tax is the best way to go there. Uh, I don't want to replace a property tax, though, for a transfer tax on real estate, because then you're not giving the property taxpayer any relief. You're just yeah. putting it, getting it from a different pocket. Right. And that has been part of the, the proposals. But you know, our state is gonna be growing rapidly. Uh, our sales tax revenues are gonna grow. And my belief that the Office of Lieutenant Governor is one that needs to be focused on the fundamentals. The Office of Lieutenant Governor is not a stage. Mm -hmm. The Office of Lieutenant Governor is not a golden microphone to get and rail about the issues. I've served in the Senate. And I know, and I've, and I've been there working and solving problems, and my belief is, the responsibility of the lieutenant governor is to be focused on those fundamentals at, in our tax structure, making certain that our first efforts when we look at those revenue streams is to find structural ways to give property tax relief so that our property taxpayers are not burdened, look for transparency and ways to deliver, and a regulatory agency that we're in at the Department of Agriculture, we've posted violators online for those that violate our weights and measures laws so that if mm -hmm. a station that you buy gas at is an right. habitual violator, you as a consumer will know it and you can That's change good. behaviors. And I think those are the kind of the things that we have to look at when it comes to um, empowering taxpayers. And we've, we've got to find a way that individual taxpayers are not punished. But I, I can tell you that taking our sales tax revenue and focusing it on property tax relief is an important way to do that. Looking for government efficiencies in a way that we deliver services is important as well. Uh, as, a, as a someone that's had to run a state agency and listening to Nancy Pelosi say the, the cupboard is bare, want to talk about <laughs> the sequestration and trying to find results, that's simple hogwash. I, I, I have followed eight years of Susan Combs at the Department of Agriculture and eight years of Rick Perry. And there are still always ways to find efficiencies if you're looking for them. Sure. You can consolidate and collapse divisions. Uh, uh, give you an example. The uh, licensing of structural pest control, we administered those tests ourselves. Mm -hmm. You had to stop your business, make an appointment when we offered that test to come in and take it. We contracted out for those tests to be given. Now there are sites all across Texas 
You, as a licensee, can schedule that based on your schedule. We lowered the fees to administer that test, mm -hmm. and we have freed up inspectors to go do what they're supposed to be doing and doing inspections. Mm -hmm. So there's ways to do that, and that's what we've got to do at, at, at levels of government is to have those efficiencies, and uh, at state government, find ways to give relief to the property taxpayer uh, that is meaningful and lasting. Okay, Jay? Yes. Um, and lowering the caps is an excellent way to, 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 to do that and to look, look for ways to do that. That's a start. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> in the forum, <clears throat> an issue came out about, I've heard it talked about before, and, and I, know, I don't know any voters that really understand this. This deals with appointing Democrats uh, to be a chairman in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the two-thirds rule. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there's a history to it, um, and this isn't something that just came out of the blue. It's been there for some time. Now, um, one, I know Dan Patrick and I forget if anybody else did, committed to eliminating, he will refuse to do that. Refuse also to, do what, to yeah. appoint Democrats for any chairs That's and to eliminate the two-thirds rule. Right. You know, uh, there has right. to be a vote on right. that. Right. So I guess my question is, what is your perspective on that? What do you plan to do? Okay. And if, if that's done, right. what would be the repercussions? Good. Well, I, I know that Dan, in the last several debates that we've been in has uh -huh. changed and has said that uh -huh. he's not saying that he won't appoint any Democrats, he's saying they don't appoint less. I see. And it may Thank be, you. It may be two, yeah. maybe one, maybe zero, and it, you know, he just he gives a range. So that, that just, just for point of clarification, I don't want to waste well, that's time That's always true that. for Lieutenant Governor Wright. They basically sure have many they want to. That's exactly so, right. Yeah. I'm going to approach it like this, recognizing that politicians of both parties have failed us. Sure. So if we think only having one party is going to solve our problems. I think that's a failed leadership perspective and that's a wrong oh, way to go solve that. problems. Yeah. But I will say this, there's going to be less, and here's how I can guarantee that. Under the current structure, the lieutenant governor establishes the committees. I'm going to lower the number of committees that we have in the state senate today. Okay. There are 18 standing committees in the state senate. Folks, there's only 31 senators. <laughs> That's not leadership just to say, okay, everybody gets to be I a never chairman. I thought about that. Yeah, yeah it, I want a limited government. I want a, a government that you don't have to run around to 18 different places to where a, an opportunity would be to hide bills, to put it in this committee. That's true. I want to lower those number of committees to a reasonable number uh, that will be efficient, that will create a lot of savings that we're not paying for on those, mm -hmm. all those other staff positions and, and, and that process. So that's my vision. So yes, there will be fewer Democrats right up front because we're gonna have fewer committees. Um, but, but I don't wanna just blindly suggest that all Republicans are gonna solve our problem because not all Republicans make the right decisions. Right. And as Lieutenant Governor, I'm gonna be very thoughtful in making certain we have committee chairs that can get in a conservative agenda passed in our state. You said you'd reduce those to a reasonable number. What do you, what, what do you consider reasonable? Yeah, I, I would like to see 11 or 12 or 14 or something like that uh, as a okay. start would be my goal. Uh, 18 is just too, too many. Uh, when it comes to the two-thirds rule, mm -hmm. the reason that wasn't a factor 20 years ago is because we had a one-party state. Right. When I ran for the state senate, we had 15 Republicans and 15 <laughs> Democrats. My race determined the partisan makeup, and we had 16. Mm. And we put 11 votes together to block the redistricting bill because they were uh, some softies were selling us out. I see. But we've come to the point, though, in our state to where we have a, a liberal minority that is blocking the conservative will of our that's state. Right. And that's why we have to either lower that threshold to a 60% threshold or eliminate that two-thirds rule on those areas that we know that they're gonna be blocking us. As Lieutenant Governor, though, I also wanna make certain that we're using the rules not to just go down there and pass a bunch of bills, but that we're using the rules to know what we're passing, number one, and that we recognize that we've got too many laws in this state, not too few. And that, that need, that's my approach and that's my philosophy and, and as, that's the way I would serve as Lieutenant Governor. What? <clears throat> There's a lot of people, I'm sure, in the state that don't know the responsibilities of a lieutenant governor. And by filming and putting this on our website, I think it would be very informative for people that uh, may not know what the duties and responsibilities and what 
what you can do as Lieutenant Governor. Well, um, I, that's very important because people don't know. When I was in the State House of Representatives, I'd see people at home on the weekends and they'd say, how come you're not in Washington? <laughs> uh, you know, so we, we, you know, this exercise is very big in educating and having high information voters. Uh, there are, uh, constitutionally, the Lieutenant Governor is the President and Pro Tem of the Senate. Um, the other responsibilities that make the Lieutenant Governor so important have been because of the Senate rules over the last hundred years. Mm. Uh, and senators can change that. Uh, I want to be the kind of lieutenant governor that uses those rules effectively. Being co-chair of the Legislative Budget Board is a very important one uh, because you help develop the state budget, you help operate the state while the legislature's not in session. That is a key element and key responsibility of the lieutenant governor. Appointing the committee chairs is a very important one. Determining the committee makeup is a very important one. I think, though, a very key responsibility of the lieutenant governor is to use the 140 days that our forefathers dedicated in our state constitution, get the work done, and go home. We, when I served in the House, we had no special sessions. It was a great time. <coughs> uh, we have problems when state government stays around too long and doesn't go back and live under the laws that you pass. I will fiercely defend uh, our constitutional role to serve for 140 days every other year. Um, that's what a lieutenant governor needs to be doing is driving and focusing on those fundamentals and that's the, the key criteria that I believe the Legislative Budget Board and the appointment but focusing our, our state and making certain that before the first gavel ever falls, you have a lieutenant governor that's going out and meeting with conservatives, talking to Texans, mm -hmm. talking to taxpayers, and let's set the legislative agenda and be the kind of leader that we need to be is what my vision is for lieutenant governor. We had talked um, and touched on Cisco before, and I told you we'd come back to that. Uh, and as you're probably aware, as one of our members' mother who uncovered this mm -hmm. scourge, yeah. um, and she took it all the way to Austin and got, got some action on it finally. It took a lot, a lot of effort to, to do that. Yeah, it did. But, it, but it's been festering. It's been there for six years. Do you, how's it, how's it, been operating under the radar for that long and is that a failure of leadership uh, do you consider that to be a failure of leadership at the governor level level lieutenant governor where where who's at fault here well I, it's my understanding that chapter 26 there's a lot of blame to go around for a lot of things but chapter 26 of the education code is requires the local school district to release that information to the local parent and tax right board. that's true and so <coughs> Sorry. I, I, I see this as as uh, w one of the elements that festers up when you just have the lack of attention to detail that occurs when we kind of fail to do our jobs and I, I think we have to have some structure in place and when I think about that there is a um, a requirement for a local health committee to talk about health issues at the local level in the school district because you know kids get sick we're all here coughing around the night mm -hmm. we need to have that same kind of requirement and structure in place to um, have these thoughtful reviews of these lesson plans and so that parents can see what's being taught and there's a formal process to do that and I think that's where that's where the gap is there are some things that I would criticize in current Lieutenant Governor about that I think that he's failed in leadership. Um, this is an area that I think uh, developed because a local taxpayer got involved and found out that we had a district that wasn't fulfilling what their responsibilities are under law, under law. And then that opened up a bigger area for us to all recognize that Austin, Austin cannot micromanage every school district's lesson plans but we do need to make certain that that structure is in place that we do have that thoughtful oversight at the local level and that parents can rise up and that they are empowered to make those changes when we recognize those failures exist of course the SCRC was the culprit and they're not subject to local review the SBOE 
No, no, not State Board of Education. Okay. State Resource Educational Centers. Oh, the... Re, the <coughs> that were formed for regional education centers. Yeah. Right, thank right, you, thank right. You. That's right. I mean, I can't... I haven't seen any reason that they should even still exist. So they're just trouble waiting to happen. You yeah. get rid of C-Scope. They're going to think of something else. And, you know... Because there's no review, no I, audit. I was on the Education Committee a few years ago and Senate Finance as well, and we mm -hmm. contemplated getting rid of the Regional Educational Service Centers. Have, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, <clears throat> there are some economies of scale and a logistical structure, and I don't, and, and, and in no way, please don't interpret this as I mean to take the role of developing those lesson plans right. and have bureaucrats do that. I mean in, in simple terms of logistics, supplies, uh, training, just like you would in a business organization. You have distribution centers in key areas of the state for your stores to go to. And there were some uh, reasonable structures there that benefited the taxpayer for that to be in place. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I don't mean that in any circumstances in terms of uh, taking the place of uh, allowing bureaucratic system to be the one that is developing our lesson plans and developing those things that violate what our value system is in terms of uh, our enterprise system, our look at uh, environmental extremism and unpatriotic mm -hmm. lesson plans in any way. How long ago was it that you were on the education supplement? Uh, 2001. Okay. Uh, 2001, 2003, and 2005 were my three sessions in the Senate. <coughs> and I asked to serve on education because it um, was such a key area of our state. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you uh, very specifically, we have been focused a lot in the last few years on career readiness and college readiness. Mm -hmm. Both very two good fields that we should be. And we need to recognize sure. that 70 to 80 percent of our jobs in Texas, they don't require a four-year degree. They do require a higher level of training. And we need to have that expectation that our kids are going in early on, recognizing that they need to be leaving with a certificate of accomplishment. That is a big measure of a success, but there's a third C that we failed on, and that's citizenship readiness. Yeah, uh, we have not been equipping our children to, from our educational process to the understanding of the principles that our founding fathers established, and we have to make certain that that is part of that process. More otherwise, if it was, if it was successful, we wouldn't have the problems that we do in society today. I think. True. I passed. Okay. Well, you know, to continue on about citizenship, Texas is a state where probably close to half of our people speak Spanish. We've got some big Oriental communities. I've been in some places where street signs are that tall so they can have multiple languages on. Um, you say here that we speak English, or that it is uh, the language of our state, but I'm pretty sure when I call the state, I get a press one for English. Mm -hmm. And almost every document I see mm -hmm. has got the flip side that's Spanish. In fact, I got one from somebody that had like six languages, a couple of Arab languages, Spanish, Chinese. So given the fact that we've got a lot of people that are speaking Spanish, how are we going to convert over to a system where we pay for a government in English and not a government in Spanish and a government in Chinese and a government in Vietnamese? How are we going to convert over to where we don't duplicate our expenses by trying to appease different languages. Well, I think that English is the official language of Texas, and we need to document that and, and reflect it in our laws. Um, um, obviously, uh, we want a system that encourages people to use English and let that be the commerce language that you can succeed in, that you can overcome your uh, difficult financial conditions and you can excel if you embrace that and that needs to be our approach we need to make certain that immersion is our structure in our schools so that we're more rapidly uh, educating our children and in the, in the language that that you can be successful in we want to encourage people to learn multiple languages I think that's great that's uh, excellent when we can do that that's a good thing but we don't need to be encouraging that when it terms of our state in the method that we do business, uh, and that only cripples individuals when we do that, I believe. And we don't need a law to allow the state to, to stop printing things in multiple languages, huh? Well, um, I, I need to do some research before I answer that question because I, I, I believe that the federal court systems have are the ones that started that on some lawsuits that Texas was sued under, so I need to go back and look at that and see 
legally where we stand. The Voting Rights Act is outdated. We it, it punishes some states and doesn't hold other states to the same standards. Mm -hmm. That is uh, that is you talk about fairness is what we're looking for for all people, no matter the color of skin or what your native language happens to be. Uh, but we're trapped in that system today because the federal government hadn't let us out of it. We need to continue to exercise through the courts opportunities to relieve ourselves from that. Uh, we need to be fair in the way we do things, but we don't need to be trapped in a system that is an unfair system. Well, we used to have two languages, English and Spanish, but now we've got two dozen languages. Mm -hmm. so well, that, that's a, that, yeah. I think that makes the point. You, you, you can't have a system that just perpetuates whatever new language comes up and happens to be in our state. You have to have a language that we use to do commerce in, and that that's that needs to be our emphasis. Maybe that's why you need to be in Washington. That's where you're I'm sorry. I'm, I, uh, that, uh, we'll let you go. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I will tell you, no, I don't want to. I don't want to cut any questions. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm curious about about phone. education. Okay. Um, when I look at my children in school, and I have grown children, I have uh, still have a uh, 12 year old daughter. What they're doing in school now is the same as was done 50 years ago when I was in school. It's like in this country we're locked into this brick and mortar system, is the way I've heard it referred to. I mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now, that's not where it's going to go. The question is, how long is it going to take us, take us as a state, and how much money are we going to waste before we move? Because brick and mortar is, is such a hindrance when you have to go someplace physically, all the expense and the security issues that we have okay. to deal with. And I know in a business, we've gone light speed into doing everything electronically. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, knowing we're going to, there would be, the minute you start changing that, you're going to get a huge pushback from the different lobbyists, you know, for the different teachers associations, right. from all your superintendents and they're wanting to keep their administrative staff and all that. The only way that I see affecting that without a huge upheaval and a huge political fight in the state, people demonstrating outside, you must hate kids, you yeah, know, that kind of right, thing, right. would be a voucher system. Mm -hmm. and yeah, of course they're gonna to object to that, but they have a harder time objecting to it because it's common sense where the student goes the money goes the with the student. So down. how would you feel about doing vouchers and, and the, the uproar that even that will cause? Yeah, actually I voted for that when I was a House member uh, on an amendment came forward and it was led by African American and Hispanic members of the legislature. Sure, in your Because they were trapped in low performing schools. That's right, that's right. And it, you know, it just makes sense to do that. Charter schools, uh, get, empowering parents is really what we're talking about yeah, to right. take the role of being involved of their children's educational process. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a state as big as Texas, all the above works and we don't need to abandon any of that and that has to be the process moving forward because the economics of it are driving this because right. of a skyrocketing property tax <laughs> rates that we started out with, finding alternative ways to deliver this educational system. Well, it's not only a good thing for the taxpayer, it's a good thing for the child yes, it because is. it opens their minds to new things and you can do that without sacrificing a quality education system. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need to just be looked at in our public education system, it needs to be looked at in our higher education system. Yeah. A, a student like me in college, I can tell you, if I would have gotten lower tuition rates, by taking seven o'clock classes, I'd have been signed up for 7 a.m. every day because I had working class parents, loved us, worked hard, mm -hmm. uh, expected us to be honest and accountable, but it was a sacrifice for them to help us to go to school. And we would have absolutely done that. And rather than always looking to build a brand new building and saying our enrollment's growing, let's look at the efficiency of how, you know, how often those classrooms were occupied. Yeah. And let that be a factor in determining are we do we really need a new building or not. And using technology, every you know, ch children have smartphones today. They're learning in that vein. We're 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 making ourselves less competitive as a state economically. That's right. It's and it's and we and I believe there are those in public education. Well, it'll make us more competitive. More competitive if we move ahead. And I and I think there are many in public education today that. Are, 
are not afraid of that if we do it in the vein that we're sitting around this table today. Let's really talk about how that will be implemented and let's look how it will work. Let's look at how it will free up resources to pay the teachers that we do have That's right. that are still in the classroom right. today. Because otherwise, we're just, <coughs> if, 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 in my agency, we've done that. I've given pay raises to my employees. We're doing things with fewer number of employees and rewarding those that are there because they're doing more and we're expecting more of them. And in education, sure. that has to be our approach. And, and I believe it can be done and it has to be done if we're going to be competitive as a state. Thank you. Thank you for hitting on that. That's a, such a key area. And it's the education today is still the biggest dollar expense in our state budget. Health and human services though is right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we cannot continue to expect to just to spend, spend, spend without looking at reforms that are meaningful. And you do not have to sacrifice our, 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 our children and the students in that process. And I know there's thoughtful people that can do that. We've gone 30 minutes in our question and answer. So. Uh, can I follow on on that just to, yeah, real sure. quick? Uh, I guess, and I don't know if you touched on that, so I was kind of buried into this, but... On, on the ratio used to be two to one uh, teachers to administrators. Okay. Now it's one to one. Can you uh, can you get that ratio back to a two to one? Is there something you can do as a lieutenant governor? Yes, legislatively we can uh, pass where that your your ratio and your budget has to be structured where those dollars are going in the classroom at a better ratio. Will through you our do funding that? Point. Absolutely, Abs absolutely. Okay. We. I, as a taxpayer, we, we can't afford a system to where we have as many administrators as you do teachers. And I'll tell you, though, one of the big reasons that it's gone to that is because of unfunded mandates from state government that force things down. A lot of it has been asked for by certain groups. And what my goal is, as lieutenant governor, I want to go to educators, teachers, put them together and say, make a list of the mandates that state government makes you to do that we can give you relief from mm -hmm. or that you that you need relief from and the same thing with cities and counties that we need to be doing I mean what we gripe about in Washington we sometimes just fall asleep at the wheel in Texas and states and are guilty of the same thing mm -hmm. and I, I and as lieutenant governor there's just a few things that we're supposed to be doing as a state a lieutenant governor's role is to be identifying those and that's what I want to do is to empower those groups and not just a one-time thing. I want to do it before every session and let's do it far enough in advance out, have those panels come together and look at what those issues are so that we can start building coalitions to repeal those. That should free up dollars in and of itself, help those ratios and uh, pay teachers. I, I want to pay teachers a good salary to be in the classroom with sure. their kids. Uh, you know, I, that's what we need to be doing and that's where our dollars need to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The, uh, you mentioned in question seven uh, that existing roads should never be converted to toll roads. Mm -hmm. Give me an overview of your uh, feeling about toll roads and, and the, the way they're done now. And, and give us an overview. I think for the last decade in our state, we have uh, tolled and bonded our way to indebtedness. And we have, a, we have abandoned our pay-as-you-go system. And uh, it uh, has led to a transportation system that has failed to meet our capacity and has failed to meet our preservation of the system to where the quality of our roads is severely uh, hampered today. Uh, I would like to see us move away from toll roads where we don't have those. I think any politician that tells you that and, and suggest that it's going to be overnight is just not being honest with you or they're going to raise your taxes through the roof. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the way to meet our needs and the way to get to, back to a pay-as-you-go system which served our state so well, and by the way, I chaired the Transportation Committee my last session um, in the Senate, Transportation and Homeland Security, Homeland Security Committee, and, and immersed myself and found some very alarming things and called it to the attention of my fellow members uh, and Senate Finance who were using fund six dollars that are supposed to go to build our roads to fund other areas of government. Sure. Uh, and the diversions, not just the last decade, but two or three decades, 
has been to the downfall of our system today that has led to diversions where we're at today. We know Houston, Road Houston, because I work downtown mm -hmm. at an oil and gas company, and they have the HOV lane. Right. Well, it used to be, you know, for high occupancy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the city, and that road's been paid for, okay? Yeah. Right. And the city of Houston decided, well, okay, we'll let people go, they pay a toll. I don't even know how they do that legally, because that's, that's a public road. Right. But should we even allow it, local jurisdictions to add a toll that has nothing to do with roads? I think they use it for metro, yeah. uh, the bus service I, I, or something like that. You know, like that. That, that's just a taxation where you're not using it for that fee and that specific yeah, purpose. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's, it's a tax, is all, all that is. Mm -hmm. And the way that we're going to get out of this, we have to be very firm and strict on diversions and yeah. of ending them. And do it in a way where you can't slide things in. It has to be transparent where you, you know, that is, everyone would see that if there's a diversion. That has to be called out in the mm -hmm. funding formula. Uh, we also, though, I, I'm opposed to raising the gas tax or having a local optional gas tax. And here's why. Um, Prius. The new electric car to yeah. let, um Tesla, Tesla, and Tesla. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're the expensive. Ones. Right. You raise a gas tax. They're not. They're not paying that that's, because that's they're right. electric. So you have an inequity in the system there. So the, the way that you do that is to number one have efficiencies in state government, look for more efficient ways to do things, mm -hmm. but then also start dedicating the general revenue dollars to the basic core function of government, and that's transportation. That's to build those roads, and that's to preserve those roads. And it's an economic function. It's a tax on you when you're sitting in congestion for sure. But we, we can't get there overnight. But the, what we can do is the motor vehicle sales tax is projected to grow very rapidly. Robert Nichols, who took my place in the state Senate uh -huh. and serves part of this county, uh, is the first one that started talking about that in recent times. But it has been talked about previously uh, years and years ago. And we need to have the dedication and leadership to say you buy a motor vehicle, you drive it on roads, let's dedicate the increases there to fix our roads and to build our roads. And it would be um, either naive or dishonest not to say, well, that's going to cut into that revenue stream that might have gone to another function of state government. But guess what? State government can be very resourceful when you're forced to do it. <laughs> and that's the way you have to do when it comes to big units of government is to force them to make tough decisions and to make those spending priorities and that that enables you and empowers the taxpayer to get done what state government should be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Okay. Including five minutes closing. Okay, so we've got about seven minutes left. Um Obviously, if we touched on this, uh, the federal government has been negligent at securing our borders. Um, what can our state leaders do, and what would you do, and have our state leaders done enough to step in to fill the gap that the federal government has? not done in securing our borders. Mm -hmm. In other words, up to and including National Guard units, mm -hmm. uh, local sheriff, local police sheriff department, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. What what can you do to mobilize that to to secure the border no matter no matter what DC says? Right. There there are several things you can do. Uh, just throwing money at a problem is not the answer. Mm -hmm. I took budget savings in my agency uh, because we came up with efficiencies. We were not appropriated for it. Uh, I gave grants to the Department of Public Safety to use in Operation Drawbridge. Operation Drawbridge uses game cameras. They're equipped with cell phones. They are placed in strategic locations along the border. Uh, and uh, they take images. They uh, send uh, notification to Border Patrol when there is that occurring of violations of entry. I want to tell you this, this is a low cost, high tech, high impact solution. I assembled landowners to meet with the DPS to get these cameras deployed uh, in a matter since um, of less, just over 18 months with a few hundred cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, that program has been responsible and apprehending almost 22,000 individuals and confiscating about 45 tons of narcotics. 
Those are tangible things that state government needs to do. What period was that? That was um, from November of this year to all of 2013 to, to about January of 2012. And it's just a, a, a few hundred cameras. Recognizing that we have two thirds of our entire southern border, and this is, this is, border security is not in my area of responsibility, but standing up for landowners is. Sure. And landowners cried out because they're being uh, rebuffed by our federal government. I've met with local sheriffs, um, our DPS, and border patrol agents, and this is th this demonstrates if you have the will to win, what can be done. Now, there's some more things that you need to do at the state level. I know our Lieutenant Governor uh, recently filed for re-election and two weeks later had a press conference announcing he was going to have $60 million for a, a border surge. Mm -hmm. Folks, border insecurity is not a new issue. Mm -hmm. We just had a legislative session when if we needed money there, that could have gone through a thoughtful process in those hearings. Trying to throw money at a problem uh, is not going to do it. As a state of Texas, we recognize that law enforcement's role is reactionary. Somebody breaks into your home, you dial 911, our good guys go after the bad guys. Our border security efforts need to be proactive, not reactive. That, and we need to be dedicating funding for intelligence, so that we can outsmart the drug cartels who have billions of dollars a year to figure out ways to enter our country illegally. But that's, there, and so those are some things at the state level that we need to do. Uh, repealing in-state tuition uh, is certainly one of those, And but I will tell you this, people are not sneaking into our country Dude, so they can go get college <laughs> tuition rates at the yeah. state level. So it is disingenuous to, to pound on that, to think that that's going to secure our border. The reason we have to do that is we've got to send a signal to Washington that we...